Hi, this is Matthias again at Carolina Raptor Center. Today, I would like to talk to you about raptor eyes. So, if Kristen can pan over to mm -hmm. our image. Um, everybody who's watching, of course, is by now an expert, right? So you know what this is, but I will tell you anyway. This is a young osprey, or fish hawk, some people call him. And you can tell he's young by two features. One involves the eyes. The fact that this osprey has orange eyes means he is a youngster, probably less than six months old. So the eyes can tell us a lot about these birds, uh, but they're also really cool to look at. And they're obviously very important for their survival. Uh, most raptors have incredible adaptations of one sort or another. So let's talk about the basic anatomy first. Um, they're actually, at first glance, pretty similar to our eyes, human eyes. So if we start in the front, here's the cornea the clear globe, then there's a chamber right behind that that's filled with clear liquid. Then we have the iris, we'll talk about that a lot. Then the osprey, this iris, this muscle right here was orange. And we have the pupil, which is the opening in the iris going into the back of the eye. This huge thing right here is the lens. Um, that allows a bird to focus up close and distant view. Um, and it's very pronounced, this happens to be an owl eye. Uh, very large in the owls, very thick, almost round like an egg. Behind the lens we have what we call the posterior chamber, so that's the biggest part of the eye, and then in the back of that posterior chamber will be the retina, just like in us, the retina where we have rods and cones, the light sensitive cells. Behind that the optic nerve connects to the eye and that of course sends signals to the brain. This is how we can see and process the signals. Um, there's a few other things that are different we're going to get to in a minute, in a minute. but uh, one thing is they actually have uh, many rods and cones. In fact, they have several different, five different kinds of cones, whereas we, I believe, only have one type. Um, so that's some of the specializations we'll talk about in a second. So at first glance, they're fairly similar to us, uh, but there are some pretty big differences. Uh, for instance, this is a barred owl. And its eyes are pretty big, so relative to the size of the bird, uh, in most birds' eyes are huge. In fact, in some cases, they can weigh up to 3% of their total body weight. Mm -hmm. I was just reading up on this. That's pretty big. Um, so even in this barred owl, its eyes are almost the size of our eyes, uh, and the bird only weighs 2 pounds. So that gives you an idea of you know, the relative size. Um, they tend to be mostly fixed in position. Um, at least in some species, and the owls more so than others, um, because they're an odd shape, there are muscles attached to these eyes. So they can move the eyeballs slightly, more so in the hawks, probably just a few degrees, literally five to ten degrees in any different, different given direction. Um, but they are fixed in place, and of course they make up for that sort of, sort of uh, handicap, you could say, by the fact that they have a very long, flexible neck, so they can move the entire skull, you know, backwards, they can turn their head upside down, uh, so they, they're more than make up for the so fact that they can't move their eyes in the sockets. Um, let's see, what's next? Um, so they also have bony rings, which I showed last time, I believe, but something really curious, um, let, me show, let me show you this here, here's, can you see that screech owl skull? I don't know if that's close enough or mm -hmm. light enough. Oh. <laughs> so that's an eastern screech owl, and you notice those rings that help support the eyes. Because the eyes are huge, they need support, basically. I think we mentioned that before. Let me go back one slide. Hold on. Previous. I accidentally scrolled forward by touching this touch screen. So something unusual they have, which we have the remnants of in our corner, the inside corner of the eye. They have what's called a nictans, a nictitating membrane. So it's an almost clear membrane that helps them in a couple different ways. Number one, it's like a squeegee, like a windshield wiper. It helps clean the eyes even when they're flying or no matter what's going on. So is that what that blue So that is what we're seeing on the bar valve, yes, that blue. So right now the nictitating membrane, which originates on the inside corner, comes across at a diagonal. Right now it's about halfway across, so it covers the entire eye when it's fully... Included. So they can close their entire eye with that? Yep. Mm -hmm. So they have, just like us, they have two eyelets, the lower one and the upper one. You can see the margin of that, but that nictans is the unusual feature 
It's very well developed. So it helps protect the eye, it helps clean the eye. Think about a raptor that is attacking something, eating prey. Prey doesn't always give up easily. Prey might fight back. The other thing that this might come in handy for, if you're a hawk mother feeding your babies, those babies are sitting in the nest reaching up, trying to get food from your beak. They could easily hit your face with their own little beaks. So this might be another layer of protection for those very important eyes when they're sitting in a nest. So it's a really cool feature. Um, a couple other things. So um, what's different from their iris is this is the iris of a great horned owl, that yellow band of muscles. muscles. Um, what's different is... So the iris is the colored part? The iris is the colored part, part yes. And that's the pupil in the middle. That's what light goes through in the middle into the back of the eye. And of course, controlling the size of the pupil changes how much light enters the eye. So in daytime, mm -hmm. an owl might constrict the eye. At nighttime, they would wide open this, you know, turn this wide open so they collect as much light as possible. Um, but what's neat is that they have control over that iris. So when you and I go to the eye doctor and they shine a light in your eye, you have to close your eye, your pupil. There's no control. There's no volume. You're not control. thinking. Yeah, you're, you're not, not thinking, thinking about, about it. it. You can think about it all you want. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Well, these are different. They use a different type of muscle called a striated muscle, and they have control over this. So even if you're shining a bright light in there, um, at some point they can decide, I'm not going to react to this, which is unusual. And we have to keep that in mind when we examine them. Because we might take that as a sign that there's something wrong there when it's really not. You're just getting used to the fact that we're shining a light in there to look inside. Um, something else very unusual in birds is, uh, and it comes from their reptilian ancestors, is they have something called a pectin. Uh, you saw it in the diagram. There's this fan-shaped structure in the back of the eye. This is what it looks like when you look straight into the eye with a special instrument. And it looks like a mountain range, basically. It's convoluted looking, it's dark brown, black, and it's huge. And there are many theories on what it does, but the most accepted one is that it probably supplies nutrition to the eye. And it helps keep fluid balance intact inside the eye. But it's very unusual, and it's also, unfortunately, sometimes a case of where injuries happen. It's, it has a very good blood supply. Uh, so when something happens and this eye gets hit, this is where bleeding happens when it's in the back of the eye. Um, let's see, what else do we have? So something else they have is, they have what's called a fovea, or in some cases, two phobias. Phobias are areas somewhere in the back of the eye, where the retina is, where the rods or cones, mostly cones really, are highly concentrated. So that's the area where they have the best vision. That makes sense if you're a hawk chasing something, you better have really good vision focused far ahead of you when you're chasing prey. So you have one or two sets of these, uh, they're highly specialized areas, uh, and that helps especially with those birds that are chasing something in mid in midair. Um, if you compare these two diagrams, you notice the different shapes, so that's a pretty common uh, theme for the owls, the nocturnal species of owls, that is not all owls are nocturnal. The nocturnal ones tend to have elongated eyes and also a larger, more protruding cornea so they can collect more light. They also tend to have that really round lens and again it helps them focus. Um, and a lot of rods especially, so an owl, a nocturnal species, would have more rods than cones because they want to be able to detect movement, light and dark uh, at night when there's limited light available. There you see the pectin um, in this eye. In the hawks, on the other hand, you have a more round eye, a globular eye, similar to ours. They don't need to collect excessive amount of lights like an owl does. So, it's, it's, uh, so they both have good vision, just in very different, in different, ways, different ways. Right. So these would be adapted for low light condition. This would be adapted for color vision to some extent. It's it's been suspected, maybe proven in some species, that some hawks have color vision just based on what type of cells they have back there, the types of cones that are in their retina. Um, it's also adapted for focusing back and forth a lot. We'll talk about that again in a minute. Let's see, what else do we have? Oh, sunshade. This comes in very handy, right? If you're a hawk flying in daytime, you're looking down on things. 
you have a built-in shade. This is called a supraorbital ridge, a fancy word for meaning above the eye. So that's a red-tailed hawk. You could even see the shadow in his eye, so exactly. you see how that's protecting it. So it's yeah. like a built-in sun visor. Yeah. All right, let's talk about, um, again, what's different. In our case, in people, in most cases, except for young infants, your eyes don't change that much. But in some of these birds, eyes change dramatically. Um, owls, in general, maintain the same eye color for their entire life. Uh, and some hawks and other species do. But there are some that have extreme changes. For instance, in this bald eagle, um, they start out with a darker brown, even darker than this, kind of a chocolate brown when they're a year old, and gradually, over the course of four or five years, they turn into this light, pale, lemon-yellow iris. So you can age a bald eagle just by the eyes, to some extent. Beyond that, you know, once they get five years old, or roughly, and obviously at that point you can't tell anymore, but it might help you determine the stages in between. A more extreme example is a Cooper's hawk. Cooper's hawks start out with gray irises when they're nestlings, youngsters, change gradually during their first year to yellow, then to orange, and eventually to a beautiful reddish, ruby red color. It might take two or three years to get there. Um, and so these colors probably mean something. They're not just there for our pleasure, I would assume. There's probably some reason for that. Um, one might be signaling other birds, what age am I? Because if an adult comes to a nest, that color might mean, oh yes, this is a nestling, this is safe to feed, whereas an adult would be a competitor. Um, it might also tell a juvenile that, hey, this is an adult, you know, if, if somebody's looking for a mate, they're going to be looking for a more mature bird that's been around for a while, is experienced in hunting, and not a juvenile. Um, so there are probably lots of reasons why they change color, but it's probably a signal of some type. So when we get birds in to rehab, we do an eye exam. It's a very important part of the exam procedure because the eyes are so pronounced, so important, and they kind of stick out almost from the skull. They're also easily injured. So here's a typical procedure here. A screech owl's getting an exam. We use a couple different instruments. Um, here is one of those specialized instruments, especially this one. It's called an ophthalmoscope, and it allows it to look into the back of the eye, which is really important. So is that the same as what a doctor would use on people? Yes, the eye doctor? similar. You see these in probably in a, an exam room stuck on the wall in a plug-in socket or something. Same thing, um, you know, because even when you look at an eye from the outside, it might look perfectly normal. Like here we're looking at the side view of a hawk eye. Um, so we have the cornea here, the, the, what we call the anterior chamber, the clear chamber, and then the pupil in the middle with the iris around it. Even if it looks perfect from the front, you can't tell what's going on in the back without a special instrument. And that's unfortunately where most of the injuries happen to be. Um, so it's really important not to skip that part. We typically do the eyes first, because that way we can cover the head and cut down on stress. Are eye injuries common? In they are. Um, I would say, I would guess at least 40% of our birds come in with eye injuries of some type or another. And that probably relates to the fact that a lot of our birds are hit by cars. That's the number one known cause of injury. And the way they're flying, the head will almost always impact first when they're hitting something like a car, a window, a fence, etc. So unfortunately, eye, eye injuries are pretty common. We have a question. Yeah. Um, I heard owl eyes are rather large and take up a lot of space in their head. Is that true? That is very true. So for instance, if we go to the skull here for a minute, Here's a screech owl skull. And notice that the eyes together take up probably at least half the space because they extend the back beyond this spot to about right here. So at least half the skull is occupied by the eyes. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so here's some of the common injuries we see. You know, some of these are pretty obvious. You look at a hawk and one eye is brown, the other eye is red. That is blood, fresh blood. So that's very common when they hit something, bleeding in this chamber that's between the pupil and the cornea. And that can actually reabsorb on its own. Sometimes we'll put medications in there. 
Medications are a bit tricky because they typically only go as far as the anterior chamber. They don't penetrate very well into the back. So we can apply topical medications like ointments or drops to these eyes, but they are not effective in the back of the eye. We have to give them other kinds of drugs which will hide in their food, for instance, to make sure they get them twice a day. Um, here's a relatively, well, relatively, here's an injury we see fairly frequently with birds that are trapped in chimneys. If you notice this barn owl, notice how its facial disc, one side is nice and white, the other side is kind of dirty looking. That's probably soot. This bird was stuck in a fireplace or a chimney for a day or two, and a common follow-up symptom would be the fact that they're sooty, because there's soot in your chimney, unless you've had it cleaned recently. If you've ever had any scratches on the eyes, you know how painful that is. You blink, every time you blink, you move something around, so the same thing happens to them. And so they can get soot on the eyes. We can stain those eyes just like you do in humans. So and that here, green here, liquid, the green that's the liquid stain? Is the stain. It's very simple to apply. And this shows up better with a blue light attached to it. And you'll notice that green spot right there. That's a scratch. You can ignore the perimeter because there's a crack there between the cornea and the, and the lids. And that's where the stain was going to It's like accumulate. pooling up it's there. It's pooling in there. But the cornea should be clean except anywhere where there is a scratch to the surface or an abrasion or something that traps the stain. So that tells us right away that that's a, it's a uh, abrasion and we can treat that with an antibiotic ointment for a couple of days. It will heal relatively quickly. Um, something I was going to throw in because it's really important this time of year. Uh, when, we, when we examine the babies, we have to keep one thing in mind is their eyes don't fully develop until they're probably six, eight, ten weeks of age, it probably varies somewhat. So when you look at a baby early on, like this barred owl is probably three to four weeks old, his pupil looks cloudy. And if you see that in an adult bird, that means something not so good is happening. A cloudy pupil or posterior chamber usually means inflammation or some type of injury in the back of the eye. This would be behind the iris. In a baby, this is normal. This is what a baby owl looks like for a couple weeks, and a baby hawk for that matter. So these, the back of the eye will be cloudy, the, the liquid that's back there is cloudy and it clears up over a few weeks. And if you don't know that, you could make the assumption that this baby must be blind, there's something going on. A cataract, for instance, would look very similar if you didn't look closely. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. And I believe that might have been the end of my show. <laughs> Any other questions? No, I don't think so. That was so great. Thank you, Matthias. Okay. You're welcome. And see you Take next care. time.